Hi everyone, I'm Anya Parampil and this is Redlines. My guest today is Max Kaiser. He's the host of the Kaiser Report on RT, as well as the Orange Pill podcast, which you can find on YouTube, iTunes, and Spotify. Welcome to the show, Max. Oh, Anya, it's my pleasure. Oh, excellent. Let's get right into this dramatic week on the stock market. Not something we usually follow too closely here, but Max, this week felt truly revolutionary. You've dubbed the GameStop Reddit stock surge as Occupy Wall Street 2.0. Why do you make that comparison? Right. So Occupy Wall Street was uh, an important event because activists around the world who were protesting for a long time against the ravages of globalization, et cetera, they finally figured out that the target is really Wall Street. And uh, they needed to reform Wall Street or they needed to get attention to Wall Street. And um, But of course, they couldn't really have much impact on the way Wall Street works. But the intention was to disrupt Wall Street and to try to stop you know, this from continuing. So uh, it's an activist driven movement. Now, this Reddit slash Wall Street bets insurgency uh, that is going on is really the same mentality. It's activists. And they, they are saying repeatedly on the Reddit boards and elsewhere that they're really not in it for the money so much as they're in it to disrupt Wall Street. They're in it to attack hedge funds. Uh, they are in it to revenge uh, what happened in 2008 when everyone got bailed out. Uh, and so it is uh, kind of a continuation of the Occupy Wall Street movement, except this time they're inside the system. They're inside the machine and they're cause, causing havoc. Uh, but the intentions are the same. And let's take a step back for a moment and help viewers understand how we got to this point. The Redditors are fighting back against a practice called naked short selling. How does short selling work and how are these day traders on the Internet able to hit back? Right. So short selling is uh, an established practice on the exchanges, and it's nothing new. It's been going on as long as there have been exchanges. And uh, to, to simplify it a bit, instead of borrowing money to buy a stock and hope that it goes up, you're borrowing a stock and selling it immediately, and you hope that it goes down. Because if it goes down in price, you can buy it back at that lower price and return it from where you borrowed it, and you get to keep the difference. If you bought it back for less than what you sold it for to begin with, you make some money. So that's called short selling, and um, there's nothing wrong with it, really, because it actually offers a bit of balance to markets because you have a lot of people interested in buying stocks, and they can borrow money to buy stocks, so there's a lot of buying pressure. So you would want, actually, the ability for players in the market to sell stock and to sell stock in a leveraged way to match the, to match the interest of the, the buy side. So you have uh, uh, buyers and sellers and they come together and uh, the result is a market price. And that market price is uh, ideally reflecting everybody's interest who's interested in both buying and selling that stock. So the difference with a naked short sale is that, and this is what the hedge fund Melvin Capital was doing, and Melvin Capital is part of Citadel Capital, what they were doing is that instead of borrowing stock and selling it in the market, they were just selling counterfeit stock. All right, they, there's this, they were just selling stock that doesn't exist in an, in an attempt to force the price down of the stock. So if the, if the way that uh, prices on stocks are, are uh, derived is that uh, the, um, the market maker looks at all the buyers and the sellers and they try to come up with a price that is uh, fair for all for all buyers and all sellers. But if somebody's there and they're counterfeiting stock to sell and they're flooding the market with these sell orders, then the specialist will mistakenly believe that there's a lot of selling going on out there and they take the price down. Uh, the intention of a naked sh um, short seller is to try to drive the price down to zero and put the company out of business. And of course, uh, they never have to pay back what they borrowed. And that's all profit. It's 100% profit. So then the question comes up, well, is this legal? And the answer is, no, it's not legal. But so much of what we find in these markets it, it, that people are doing in these markets is legal. I'm sorry, is illegal. 
The problem is that these laws are not enforced. Uh, most, most, most activities we see on Wall Street are, to some degree, illegal. Naked short selling is one of them. Uh, all the accounting frauds we see conducted by all the banks are illegal, but there's very little enforcement. Uh, the big banks are caught rigging markets, whether it's LIBOR market in London or the precious metals market here in the United States or elsewhere in the world. They get caught. The regulators might uh, levy a bit of a fine, but they get to keep 90 cents of every dollar they steal. And uh, there is really a lawless environment. So what the Reddit crowd did was they dug into the minutia of all of this, uh, what's going on with these uh, short sales and naked short sales and hedge funds. And uh, they figured out that in this particular instance with GameStop, the number of counterfeit shares that had been sold on the market naked was extraordinarily high. Uh, something like 150 or 160 percent more than the actual stock that exists. And so it therefore reasons that if they came in and started buying that stock, the hedge fund completely would be caught off guard. And of course, they are if the stock goes up in price, then they're sitting on a loss. So they the only way to resolve that is they have to buy it, buy that stock in the open market. And then you have what's called a, a short squeeze. Uh, the short squeeze is you've got hedge funds in this case trying to uh, reconcile the fact that they're losing money because what they sold shorts going up unexpectedly and they go in there to buy it. But of course, when you the, the specialist now sees those buy orders and it jacks the price up and then that encourages more people to pile in and say, oh, wow, we've got a short squeeze going, uh, which in this case prompted hundreds of thousands of these day traders to pile in and to essentially bankrupt the hedge fund. So the hedge fund was A, engaged in illegal activity, and B, they were unhedged, right? So, I mean, this is the remarkable, for me as a former stockbroker, this is, I think, the funniest part of it all is that they're unhedged. There's a way that they could have prevented this from happening if they wanted to hedge their hedge, but they, they failed to do that. Uh, and now, um, continuing on, uh, we've got a lot more problems that resulted as the result of this uh, short squeeze on this particular stock. It kind of rippled out and caused a lot of problems uh, on different layers of, of the regula regulatory environment in the market, et cetera. But that's essentially what happened. And in response to the GameStop surge, a stock trading app called Robinhood, which many of these day traders were using to buy and sell shares, actually banned users from buying GameStop shares, which intentionally drove down the price uh, of those stocks. This is strange, though, because Robinhood brands itself as a trading app for the common man. On its website, it says it believes the financial system should be built to work for everyone. So it was essentially destroying its own business model and alienating its customer base. Why would they do something like that? Well, because uh, Robinhood, of course, the trading is free. And we know from the social media business that anytime anything's free, you are the product. And in this case, the Robinhood traders are the product. And who's the buyer of that product? It's, in this case, Citadel, the hedge fund, is 40% of the profits for Robinhood. They buy data from Robinhood, from traders on the website, on the app, to front run those traders. And that means that they get to see the trades before they're executed, they put on their own trade, and they may profit from that inside information. So Robinhood is selling inside information to Citadel, who has 40% of the revenues uh, for Robinhood. So there's a direct, of course, conflict of interest. And by the way, front running is also illegal. But again, it's not enforced. Uh, and so um, that's why when Citadel called them up and said, look, uh, one of our subsidiaries here, Melvin Capital, is uh, going to lose billions of dollars. Uh, we're going to have to bail them out. And Citadel bailed out, by the way, uh, Melvin Capital with the money that they got from U.S. taxpayers because last year Citadel had to be bailed out. And who, by the way, is on Citadel's board? Uh, none other than Ben Bernanke, former Fed chairman. <laughs> that's right. Wow. So it's a whole it's a whole layered cluster of fraud. It's right. That's why another reason it's difficult to prosecute because it's essentially racketeering. The only way to go after this is to uh, apply racketeering laws to get all the pieces of the puzzle simultaneously. But as long as regulators go after piece, piecemeal, 
Uh, there, it's a basically whack-a-mole, and the fraud is passed from hand to hand, and, and nothing ever uh, is is changed. And there's no reform. So uh, that's why Robinhood essentially shut out their own business uh, customers because they're banking on number one appeasing Citadel, uh, they're kind of their boss, uh, who's who's in bed with Washington D.C. insiders. And by the way, trading on inside information is legal for America's senators and congressmen. There's no law against that at the moment. And uh, be, and thinking that well, this will blow over. And there's also scheduled to do an initial public offering. Robinhood. So that would be a huge windfall for all the shareholders, all the stakeholders, uh, and for Ben Bernanke and for Citadel, Ken Griffin, and all the all the players involved. So it's a calculated guess that A, they'll get they'll get away with it, which they probably will, because no one ever prosecutes financial crimes in America. B, the public will forget about it. C, if if there is a sense that this may actually bring in a wave of reform then we'll see a market crash. Uh, this is a trick now we've seen a few times. Uh, whenever it looks like regulators or the, the public is outraged over Wall Street, they simply crash the market until people start panicking and then begging these people to help them solve this problem. And then they ride in on their white horse and they solve the problem in exchange for a lot of free money that's printed up for them and more deregulation. And this has been going on for 30, 40 years. The same same cycle over and over again. Today, it's Robin Hood. Uh, we've seen similar cycles with long-term capital management is kind of an institutional version of the same criminal behavior. Uh, the, you have MF Global, which Jamie Dimon was involved with, the Ray uh, Corzine, John Corzine. It's kind of a similar story, slightly different players, slightly different mix of fraud, but basically the same idea. Uh, the crashes of 87, the crash of 2008, the dot-com crash all have their root causes in similar fraud being conducted by the same people uh, without any uh, kind of expectation of any penalties being levied out, except for some very light fines. Uh, you know, JP Morgan was just found manipulating the precious metals market. They were fined nearly a billion dollars. They made close to $20 billion with that manipulation. And by the way, how did they pay for the fine? They manipulated the precious metals market. And Biden, Secretary of the Treasury, Janet Yellen, who also served as chair of the Federal Reserve, there were just reports surfacing that she received a payment for a speech she gave speaking to Citadel. And so it, there's a theme here. There's a common thread which you've you've spelled out. Right, the, the revolving door between Federal Reserve chair people and Wall Street, just mm -hmm. like in, in, in all other industries. The lobbyists, you know, they work, they do, they work the lobbyists in D.C., then they go in the private sector, then they go in the public sector. And, um, you know, Barack Obama was a president for eight years. He looks great on his resume. Then he cuts a, you know, multi-picture deal with Netflix, right? right. Janet Yellen is at the Federal Reserve Bank uh, doing her, quote, public service. And then she goes over to Citadel for millions of dollars in speaking fees. And now she's back at the Treasury, essentially opening the spigots of cash to Ken Griffith and Citadel. She's committing, I would say, I would call it, uh, it it's called control fraud, to, to, to use the technical terms. Um, it's the, all of the mechanisms of control are being operated by fraudulent actors. And it's, it's, uh, it's systemic and it's draining the economy of vital economic resources. And uh, people can't afford housing. They can't afford health care. They can't afford education. Why? Because money's been stolen by mm -hmm. Janet Yellen, Ben Bernanke, Citadel, uh, Melvin Capital, uh, and all the same players, all the same guys doing the same thing year after year. And uh, there hasn't been any, any doesn't look like anybody's going to stop it anytime soon. And what does this dynamic, which you've described regarding Robin Hood, it's actually called Robin Hood the app, saying that it's working for the common man, but then you've explained how it was turning around and selling that data, essentially committing insider trading to help out these larger hedge funds. Does anyone truly work for the average guy or the average investor on Wall Street? Bitcoin. You know, a Bitcoin is the only way that the average person is going to escape this nightmare because it's unconfiscatable, it's uncensorable, and it's immutable. And once you have Bitcoin wealth, you, they can't take it from you. 
and it's only going to go up in price because the fiat money world is constantly being debased by printing trillions and trillions and trillions more of fiat money on a continuous basis. And that's why Bitcoin is at thirty-six, thirty-seven thousand dollars per Bitcoin. And I told my audience on Kaiser Report to start buying it at one dollar, for the exact reason that the system is is systemically correct, corrupt. It's never going to change. There's no laws that are ever going to come on board to change it. And only Bitcoin gives you a way out of, as Christine Lagarde recently said, and she's over at the European Central Bank now, that Bitcoin right. is the escape valve. You know, she said it. Uh, in a way that was uh, not supposed to be flattering, but there, there, there it is. She, she's absolutely right. It is an escape valve from the IMF, the ECB, the Federal Reserve Bank, the, so the, uh, the, the Central Bank of uh, New York, uh, and, and the entire system. And, and more people are, you know, Wall Street bets and uh, the Reddit chat boards, et cetera. Th those people are going to get fed up. You know, Dave Portnoy over at uh, Barstool Sports, Sports he was loving day trading during lockdown and making money. And then he suddenly he got an education on how this thing really works. And he's a guy that's going to be a, buying Bitcoin uh, aggressively very soon because he'll realize there's absolutely no way to reform the system. I'm glad you brought up Dave Portnoy because I was going to ask you about his recent comments to Tucker Carlson. He called for an investigation into the Robinhood decision to ban the buying of GameStop shares and said people should probably be jailed for these actions. When I saw what uh, Robinhood was doing, ironically, Robinhood take from, you know, take from the rich and give to the poor, even though they do the exact <laughs> opposite. I was stunned. Uh, I think it's criminal. I think there has to be an investigation. I think people have to go to jail. Whether that actually happens, I don't know. But I've never been more convinced about market manipulation and the people, the hedge funds, controlling the game than today. Do you agree with him? <laughs> well, you know, in China, uh, when they find this type of fraud committed, they behead bankers, right? And uh, I think that's a suitable punishment. But in America, what we do is we print money for them and we blow kisses and we give them, we say, hey, run, run the IMF. Here, have another trillion dollar free gift from the Federal Reserve Bank and buy some stock in your own company and make your stock executive options go higher and pay yourself a billion dollar bonus. So America attitude toward recidivist banking cartel crooks is like America's relationship with the Sopranos or the Godfather. We love these criminals. We lionize them. We make movies about them. We aspire to be them, but we're never going to stop them. And a big part of that mentality is, of course, the media. And throughout this entire saga, corporate financial outlets have paraded hedge funder after hedge funder to attack the Redditors and complain they aren't playing a fair game. The reason the market is doing what it's doing is people are sitting at home getting the checks from the government, okay, and this fair share is a bullshit concept. It's just a way of attacking wealthy people. And, you know, I think it's inappropriate. We all got to work together and pull together. What do you think this experience has revealed to us about the hosts and producers who work for outlets such as CNBC? I see them just making excuses for the top dog, the guy at the top of the food chain consistently. Yeah, you know, that's what our show, Kaiser Report, was, uh, we, we started, we've been doing it for almost 20 years now, and the, we, the reason we started doing it and all of our other content is to offer the conflicting story, the opposite side of the story to what is put out by CNBC and the financial news media, by Financial Times, by uh, other newspapers. When I first met Stacy back in 2003, I was reading the Financial Times every day, and I said, if you know how to decode this paper, I'll tell you what's going to happen next week or two weeks from now, because it's basically broadcasting to the financial com community for crimes that are about to take place so that they can position themselves and profit from it. And I would say, you see the story? They mentioned this, this, and this. I, within two weeks, this bank will do this Y, X, Y, and Z, right? And it would always, you know, most of the time it would happen. It, it's considered to be uh, an important part of the economy. Remember Eric Holder, who was uh, Barack Obama's attorney general, said banks are too big to jail. It's called the uh, Eric Holder Doctrine. The Holder Doctrine gave a green light to fraud, gave a green light to what I call financial terrorism. 
And of course, he was involved in the HSBC mess, where HSBC was caught laundering money for the Sinola, uh, Sinaloa car, Mexican drug cartel, uh, 60,000 dead Mexicans. Uh, we questioned about it, him directly, and uh, he, he, he was uh, quite flustered when we talked to him about it, but essentially he hid under the cloak of this is systemically important, we can't go after the banks, uh, we can't prosecute the banks. So, so when uh, George Osborne reached out from the UK and asked you to go soft on HSBC when they were caught laundering money for Mexican drug cartels, was that something yet you now regret, having resulted in massive uh, scandals in Mexico, 60,000 dead in Mexico? Well, come on, man. you can't possibly think that what we did in connection with the resolution of a financial um, well, yeah, had something to a do straight with up and down case of money laundering for HSBC. You guys, George Osborne reached out to you guys, said go soft on the case. Uh, but the, the, connection that you're drawing, but the connection that you're drawing between that which was a financial determination and the deaths of people in Mexico is inconsistent with the facts. Essentially, he was trying to make the case that they're God and you can't fight God. And so when you have a culture and a society and a political class that worships financial terrorism as gods, that's a problem. I would say so. And finally, Max, what do you think the lasting impact of this experience will be on Wall Street? Either uh, unintentional consequences that will come or deliberate? Will there be a crackdown on the little guy? We hear people screaming about regulations now, but not for not for the hedge funders, for the Redditors. W where do you think all this will go? Is Wall Street forever changed? Well, it's more censorship. So we see censorship is creeping into speech. So people can't express themselves online anymore without draconian censorship swooping in from these big tech companies. And now we have financial censorship. You won't be able to buy and sell stocks in a way that is any way is going to take a penny away from the corrupt hedge fund class. And they'll use censorship. They'll shut down your stock. They'll take stock out of your account. They'll take money out of your account. So that's what they're doing at Robinhood. They're just taking, freezing people's accounts and taking cash out. Uh, we saw that in Cyprus a few years ago. They had a bail-in. They just took cash out of people's accounts. So it's censorship. Financial censorship is now going to be joining speech censorship. So for those who are not part of the kleptocratic class, uh, it's going to be more uh, less free. Well, it's a model I call the casino gulag, where you're free to stay in your home and and play games online at Facebook in exchange for a protein pill to keep you alive another day to click on more ads. But if you start to make any serious money, then the mafia, that is the central banks and the Wall Street banks will come to your house and they'll torch it. They'll burn it down. And they got the insurance too. So they'll collect the insurance money. Remember Goldman Sachs, not only during the 2008 crisis, it came out in congressional testimony that not only were they selling what was euphemistically called by Goldman Sachs and quoted in testimony bags of shit to their own clients, they then made these same kind of sh short sale bets against their own clients, knowing that their clients would go bankrupt and making money on their bankruptcy. Remember, Greece was sold bags of shit by Goldman Sachs, knowing it would destroy the country. They then made bets against Greece and made uh, a $5 billion in credit default swaps. Uh, on the destruction of Greece. Uh, the housing market of 2008 collapsed. The movie, The Big Short, a few insiders made a lot of money on that catastrophe. Um, this is, uh, if it gets really bad, then some of these hedge funds will book huge profits. If they need to, they'll crash the stock market and engage in extortion like they did in 2008. Remember Hank Paulson was trying to get a 700 to a trillion dollar check from Congress with no strength, no, no strength attached, no details. It was just one piece of paper, send me a trillion dollars and or $700 billion and Congress balked. And they said, you know, we, we really need to discuss this. Well, they went in the next day, hit the sell button, naked short sales, right? Just counterfeit sales. They crashed the stock market. And by the three o'clock in the afternoon, Congress was uh, on their knees begging for help and they gave them the money. So it's extraordinary. You know, it's, it's, it's extortion. So I, I would imagine if, in fact, there's any hint of any reining in of the fraud, we're going to have an extortionary crash. And we've had that now at least six or seven times documented, fully provable. 
we'll have that. Or two, it'll just get forgotten by whatever the next fake crisis generated by the talking heads on TV want to create. But there will be no reform, and the wealth will continue to be extracted from the economy, and we're going to have real inflation as a result of it. So instead of just having health care, education, uh, and um, cost beyond and housing go beyond the cost of everybody except for the plutocrats, now it's going to hit food and energy. So we're going to have a lot of people who can't afford food in this country or energy. That'll be the next wave. And uh, the, the, the solution from the, our policymakers in Washington and Wall Street will be, well, give us more money and deregulate us more. That'll be their solution. And if you don't, we're going to crash the economy again. Rents repeat. It's been going on for 30 years. Yeah. Are we, are we not due for some upheaval in the market regardless, just considering it's already been kept artificially high considering the economic situation in the United States over the last year. I know the Federal Reserve has pumped tons of money in order to keep the large financial institutions afloat. But is this a, a, is the record stock market really based in, in reality or was it not headed for a crash anyway? The risk for this is Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is now a $600 billion asset. There's a, po there's a strong possibility that before the end of the year, it'll be worth 4 to $5 trillion and on its way to be worth uh, $50, $60, $70 trillion. It's, Bitcoin is challenging the entire uh, global banking system. And it's defunding the central banks and it's defunding fiat money and it's defunding the Wall Street banks. And w within the two or three years, those with some Bitcoin will be the only ones with any capital whatsoever. And then the politicians will come begging for a bailout from people with Bitcoin. I think you'll be offered a chance to pay your in your taxes with a 90% discount if you pay in Bitcoin. Um, you know, so Bitcoin is really the uh, the, the the central bank killer, and uh, more corporations are using it on their corporate balance sheet. Uh, the potential, you know, th this is. You know, if you know the history of Bitcoin, it was born out of a protest movement against central banks. It says right there in the first block uh, ever uh, in Bitcoin, uh, ch uh, Chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks. It's hard coded into the actual what's called the Genesis block. It's a protest against central banks. And it's gone from being worth nothing to being worth $600 billion. And now it looks like by the end of the year, it'll be worth half the value of gold, all the gold in the world. Uh, which would be about four and a half to five trillion dollars. And uh, it's totally rewriting the entire global economy. And that's if anybody wants to opt out, if anyone wants individual sovereignty, if anyone wants to do what Robin Hood traders are doing, but for real, to the entrenched kleptocrats, they should be buying as much Bitcoin as possible. Well, everything you've described about our current system definitely makes it obvious it's rotten to the core and we need to be seeking out alternatives. So if people are interested, they should definitely follow the Kaiser Report and the Orange Pill podcast if they don't already to learn all about Bitcoin and everything that's going on in the alternative market. So Max Kaiser, I really appreciate you coming on today. My pleasure, Anya.